body. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Wallace. I'm the Young Pharma Coordinator based out of uh, Benalla in Northeast Victoria. Uh, welcome to the second of the five part farm finance getting um, prepared webinar series. Uh, so this session will be recorded and shared with those who can't make the session, um, which we know has been valuable for Carly. So just if you've got any dramas with that, please let me know. Um, so this series of webinars aims to provide you with a bit of an introduction uh, to farm finance and what you need to know to get started. Um, it's delivered by Agriculture Victoria as part of the Smarter Safer Farms initiative. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. Uh, I pay my respects to the elders uh, past, present and emerging and the Aboriginal elders of other communities that are here virtually with us today. I'd also like to introduce Pippa Old, who's here to moderate tonight's webinar and Jane Foster from ORM, who will uh, introduce herself um, in a few minutes time. So if we can go to the next slide. Sure thing. So we'll just start off um, with a few little, oh, and there we go. So this is the first, the second of five. So we've got um, three more uh, webinars coming up. We've got farm business risks on the 29th of April, um, business risks and their impact on cash flow on the 13th of May, and then putting the plan into actions. And if this is the first time you're joining us tonight, if you would like to uh, listen into the, the first session we did on the business case, uh, please just yeah, send me an email and I can send you the, the link to um, that one's recording. But don't stress, you don't have to have participated um, last time. Um, you can certainly join in at any any point in this program um, and, and Jane will, will, you know, we don't have to cover the same ground. So you can do them independently or, or tune into all five. So uh, next slide. So um, for those of you um, who may not have used Zoom as your the platform tonight, um, there is a, um, this is sort of what your dashboards should look like. So we do encourage you to stay on mute if you can um, and you can leave your videos off. It just helps with bandwidth um, for people. Um, but we do encourage you to use the chat um, function. I started chat before and we've got a few using it already, which is fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, so if you do have questions, pop them in the chat so we can follow up with those. And I will just go to the next slide. So we'll kick off um, this evening's presentation with a quick um, poll to find out what industry you're from and if you've, Tonight, oh, sorry, tonight's webinar is about cash flow. So we just want to get start off with a bit of a, an understanding of, you know, have you done a cash flow budget before? And it's certainly okay if you haven't. If you're not sure if you have done one, um, just pop pop your answer in the poll and that will help give us a bit of an un understanding of, of who's in the room um, and we can adjust the pace accordingly. So how are we going with those, Pip? Uh, yeah, we've just got a few more answers to come in, I think, and then we can put the results up. I'll just give everyone 10 or 15 more seconds to get their responses in. Fantastic. Thanks, Pippa. Well, while people are just finishing that off, did you want me to introduce myself, Sarah? We'll give them a bit of time sure. while I'm chatting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Thanks, Jane. No worries. So, yeah, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name's Jane Foster, and I'm a senior consultant with ORM Consulting and Communications in Bendigo. Uh, so I work one-on-one -on -one with a lot of farming businesses around business management, uh, succession planning, and we do indeed do a quite an amount of budgeting work with individual farming clients. So 
I'm really uh, looking forward to working through creating a cash flow with you all tonight and giving you <laughs> some practical hints. Have we lost Jane there? Just for a moment, I think All she'll right. be back. But well, how's our poll looking? Uh, yeah. So, can you see it, Sarah, or is it not showing up? No, if for you, you could talk okay. us through it, that would All be All righty. So, everyone else should be able to see the results um, that have come in. So, we've got eighty percent of livestock industry people tonight and we've got it's 50 says 50 percent cropping as well so we must have a few um mixed farming enterprises going on there um and we've got one person from hort so that's great to have someone oh, representing fantastic. that cohort and uh 50 of people are saying they have completed a cash flow budget of some sort before 40% are saying no and 10% are saying they're not sure. So we've got a good mix out there. Fantastic. Um, yeah. That's great. Well, everyone's figured out how to respond to the poll. That's great. And if your industry um, wasn't captured, feel free to, to pop it in the chat and we can, um, yeah, find out what's missing. So thank you. Looks like Jane's back now. Welcome back, Jane. We've just Sorry. gone through the poll results. So Sorry. feel free to. <laughs> um, I just can't screen share at the moment, Pippa, so I'm sure you'll sort that one out for me. Yep. Yes. Just yes. bear with me one second. Sorry, everybody, that was really inopportune timing there. So, that's okay, but you could probably cover what we're going to talk about tonight through that first. Sure, can I just, uh, I still don't have screen share, but right, that's okay. Can yep. you see it coming up now? I can, yep. I can. Okay. Is this sort of where we were up to? Yeah, yeah. it is. So awesome. am I not able to screen share Pippa? Is it not going to work or? Um, oh, I'll just yeah. make Jane the host. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Again. Sorry. Just probably. Apologies, easier. everyone. That's all right. I think we're, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you might need to make Jane the host, I think. Wait, let me do it. Yeah, I still can't screen share, sorry. Is it not working, Pepper? Should I? Uh, I'm just adding you in. Ah, here we go. That should, yeah. That now I'm away, <laughs> definitely. Okay. So, hoping that's all back. Yep, great. And we're back to where we started. Perfect. Okay, so sorry everyone, before I actually um, just dropped off the line there, I was just explaining that, yes, I'm looking forward to working through creating a cash flow this evening and I'll endeavour to also work through it with you and explain why some of these principles and concepts are actually quite important when it comes to um, a applying for bank finance or dealing with banks and they'll often uh, ask to see a cash flow which just helps them uh, understand a little bit more about what your business is doing and ensure that they can actually make a assessment on any requests for loans. 
So what we're going to work through tonight is, um, as you'll see on the screen, we'll work through farm income. We'll look at farm variable costs. We'll move on to farm fixed costs, discuss wages and drawings. I'll show you what the summary of a cash flow looks like and just explain a little bit of the detail around that. And then we'll also talk through capital expenditure and how that fits in with cash flow budgeting. So that's a bit of the plan for this evening. And we've got uh, at least sort of the next hour and a bit together. So it gives us plenty of time. And I just encourage you all to send through also any questions as we go, um, particularly, you know, we'll probably stop after the segments and answer the questions then but feel free to shoot them through in the chat box as you think of them uh, and we'll work through it that way. So we're going to discuss uh, firstly farm income. So when we are preparing cash flow budgets we've got to make some assessments of what we think our income over the cash flow period will be and that will require a couple of steps. One of the things I did want to highlight as we rolled into this session is that cash flow is not profit and profit is not cash flow, which might seem some people might have a bit of a uh, familiarisation with this or, or not. So what that can mean is that cash flow, whilst we might be profitable over a 12-month period, um, it doesn't always tell us everything we need to know about what the cash flow of the business is doing on a month by month basis. So in my experience in banking, I have had situations where businesses are profitable, but at different times in the year, they actually can be quite uh, cash flow stressed depending on the matching between their income and their expenses. So in terms of our farming income, where does it come from? Well, it obviously comes from a number of sources. Uh, it depends which inter enterprise you are actively engaged in conducting. So obviously up there on the screen is a few examples of different enterprises, um, some ranging from intensive type productions, so broiler farms, or it might be involved in horticulture, um, obviously there's pigs, there's broadacre livestock operations. So there's quite a range of different industries uh, in under this banner of, I guess, farming that we could be involved in. But the income generally is produced by um, growing or raising or producing food or fibre. And so that's what we're really focused on is uh, how we go about doing that and accessing markets and turning whatever it is we produce into income. So on that, when we're looking at the income that we're going to be forecasting in our cash flow budget, we've got to really consider a couple of different aspects. So depending on which industry we're involved in, we really have to make an analysis of our production cycle. And so that can be very different depending on if you're involved in um, livestock beef cattle or if you're involved in dairy um, versus cropping. So they all have um, a somewhat different production cycle. So you've got to analyse what is going to be produced, obviously when it's going to be produced because that will be important as to when you can actually uh, access markets to sell it. The, one of the key things is what quantity or volume of goods can be produced. So if you're in dairy farming, that'll be your milk. And we'll look at um, an example of dairy as we go through tonight's session. If you're in cropping, it'll be particularly grain or hay. And so how much grain or hay could you reasonably expect to produce in a given year? Um, if it's say some other different uh, um, commodity. So if we're looking at broiler production, um, we generally know how many uh, chickens we can raise over what time cycle and how many we can expect to um, produce at the end of a certain period of time. Then some of the next considerations will be what is the market value of that production? 
So does the value of that good fluctuate? So you might be quite used to seeing things like grain prices, which are regularly uh, moving around depending on what grains available and who's looking to buy. You need to understand the timing of sales and any repayment or payment terms. So that will be really important in how you're able to forecast your income through say a 12 month period. And when I'm talking about cash flow tonight, I'm going to generally be referring to 12 month period. And that's usually about as long as you'd ever be expected to forecast a cash flow um, out for. Some businesses might look at them over a shorter period of time, just on three month cycles. Some look at six months. But I guess, for instance, if you're in a cropping business, it is pretty much an annual production cycle. So it probably makes sense that we look at it. We might move on to the next slide. Okay, I think we missed a one or two there. Need to go back. Uh, okay, and we're not having, <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about income, farm income, I've actually uh, got an example here, which is a dairy example. So what we're looking at here is a farm, a dairy farm comprising 73 hectares. There's 282 um, cows on this uh, business in this dairy. And they're producing around nearly, um, what's that, 3 million litres of milk. And we've got milk solid production in there. Um, generally speaking, to be able to forecast our income for a dairy business, we're really going to have to have a estimate on total milk production. So what the cows as a collective group will produce the percentage of butter, fat and proteins because the milk solids is quite an important component of the way in which the milk produce is actually valued and paid. So when we do that, we, can, we need to really understand obviously what we can produce uh, because that's going to have a really strong flow on effect as to how much income we can receive over the course of 12 months. And so what we can see there, at essentially that milk production averaging about 10 and a half thousand litres per cow with those types of um, figures on milk solids, that would estimate out to a milk income production uh, value of $1.580 million in the year. And so what that uh, enables us to do is then forward plan our income through a 12 month period. So if we move on to the next uh, slide, maybe Pippa, just one more. Okay. So then this is actually a template that's provided by Dairy Australia, which enables um, a business involved in dairying to go through and actually create their own cash flow over a 12 month period, which is actually really helpful to be able to budget and manage income and expenses. And so what uh, I've got there is really the how you'd go about the estimate of income. So we go on a month by month basis. So to get that million and uh, odd figure for income in total, we can distribute that throughout the year. So we'd obviously have to understand that particularly with dairy, there's going to be a peak lactation period and then that will slowly fall away. We might dry off for a couple of months. So that would mean essentially that there would be no income. And so they're the types of things that we need to understand about our production system to then mirror that onto a cash flow budget. So it doesn't make much sense in a dairying scenario if you do have a peak lactation and do dry off. Um, to average out that total income over the 12 months because realistically that's not how it's actually going to be 
received and you find you end up with quite a mismatch in some months between what you're expecting or estimating and what you actually received into your bank account. So in terms of income, there might be that primary sort of production-based income. So in this instance, it's milk income. Uh, but then as you move through, there might be some other things like in dairy, they, get the, uh, they can get retrospective or step-up payments. They might actually sell some livestock. So they might uh, move some cows out of the dairy herd and sell those off. Uh, they may even have some additional feed or water that uh, can be sold off. So there might be a few different components to income, but generally speaking, the main one is probably going to be the primary production. And then you'll have some other incidental pieces associated with that. So we might move on to the next slide from here. Okay, so I had it uh, obviously that estimate for dairy. And so in dairying, that's really based around how many dairy cows you can manage on a given property and what their average annual lactation looks like and their percentage of uh, milk solids. So if we move to a different type of enterprise, so example in this situation, if we're looking at a mixed farming enterprise and if we're mixed between um, say grain, hay and livestock, I'll show you through this example. In this type of scenario, what we really have to understand clearly and try and estimate is how much area we have under crop. So you'll see in that first uh, column, after we've nominated our crop type, we'll have our, it says unit there, that means um, T for tonnes. So everything's estimated in tonnes here, unless otherwise specified in the um, banner heading. So cropped area in hectares, you'll see here, there's a total of uh, 2,463 for grain, 145 hectares for hay. And that brings us to a total of about 2,600. So then what we've done is we break that up between the, the individual crop types. So barley, canola, field peas, lentils, wheat, and oat and hay. And to understand how many total tonnes of production, we are estimating our average yield. So our average yield in say tonnes per hectare in this example, um, and you'll see there, so for barley, the estimate is 2.5 tonnes per hectare. And so that would mean that in total, for barley, we'd be looking at about 2,600 tonnes of total production. And we have to estimate an average price we'd expect to receive for that. Uh, say two, in this instance, we've nominated $218 a tonne. And so that would bring the total value of the barley production to 570,000 in round numbers. And we go through and do that for each of our individual crops. And we do that for our hay as well. And so in that way, we can actually forecast an estimated total value of the production for um, that given period. And you'll see in this example that we've estimated our total is about $1.552 million. And so that's where I, th I think the next point that's important would be the timing of that production. So if I was talking to you now, we're in April, we're yet to generally across Victoria, we sow our crops over the next month or so. Uh, they obviously go through the winter and the growing season and we harvest starting from about September, October. Um, and so it would be around that time that that crop would actually be available um, to sell. So when I talk about forecasting income, we have to make a couple of broad assumptions. And we also did that in the dairy example. We, we had to make some assumptions about our average annual um, production per cow. We had to estimate our total milk solids so we could get a value of that annual production. So in cropping, it's a similar story, but this time we're talking about measuring our yield in tonnes per hectare. And the other thing that we have to make some assumptions about is our price per tonne. And so it's really a factor of those two assumptions that give us our total um, annual value of production. 
So if I think if I move to the next slide, Pippa, I'm going to show you just a little quick example of livestock. So to estimate these, we really look at how many we start with as our opening balance. Then we add any new production. So that could be um, obviously if we've lambed down, we, look, we then add any purchases, uh, deduct any sales, and what we do also then you'll see age out, age in. So as we progress through the year, those um, weaners will move out and become weathers and ewes. And that way we can keep a running tally of our actual um, livestock trading balance. And one of the key things is obviously our livestock sales that we're able to um, undertake throughout the year. And again, we have to have an understanding of when those categories of livestock will be able to be sold at market. So that's uh, that in combination, say, with the cropping estimates will tell us a little bit about our total um, income that we were able to produce. So in terms Sorry, of- Jane. I yeah. just want to chip in. Carly's got a question just on the last slide. The income split, is that for say share farming was her question? Oh, okay. Well, maybe if I could just go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, so it would be, um, obviously there's nothing in that column in this instance, but yes, if it was a share farming scenario. So say if it's a 70-30 split, um, we would put in there if you're to receive 70%, that's what that's the figure we would put in there, and then that would flow through to give you 70% of that income. So, yep, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> okay, thanks, so Jane. Moving forward, okay, so in terms of livestock, and um, particularly this would be in say the scenario where we're talking about um, sheep. There's a couple of assumptions that you'll have to use. One would be weaning rate. So if you know how many ewes you have, um, you should have basically a bit of a historical understanding on the, your percentage weaning rate. So if you had 100 ewes and your weaning rate's 110%, you should end up with basically 110 lambs weaned. There's also, um, you'd want to know how many you're going to retain. So if you've got a self-replacing flock, you'll obviously have to retain a percentage of animals. So they will not be available for sale because they'll be going in to replace um, animals that might be leaving if they're, say, cull for age. And then the other thing that you have to estimate is the sale price of livestock. So what we do, generally speaking, with sale prices, we might look historically at the last six months in the markets um, or with grain, we'll often look at what a decile five price looks like and we'll select that as our midpoint range. Okay, so that's probably um, as much as I needed to say there. So we might move on to that next slide. And this is essentially taking the actual numbers of livestock and we're converting it through here into an actual value in dollar terms. Uh, so we've taken whatever the sales numbers were and then we've multiplied that by our expected market price. And that gives us our sale values across a number of our livestock categories. You'll notice that the weather numbers there are higher than the U numbers because it would look like there is an element of um, some animals being kept back for replacing um, any older ewes. And you'll see some sales out there of ewes, so they'd be older animals. Okay. So if we're moving on, I think we've got a poll question ready to go for the audience. We do, just to check to see if we've been paying attention, Jane. Yes, very good. <laughs> <laughs> and Okay, so the farm income poll. Uh, the question that we're asking... You might need to jump in there, Pippa. 
Yeah, so we might have lost Jane again, but that is okay because we've got the question up the greatest risk to my farm business is and select all that apply below so you can see that some of the answers are coming in now so we'll let you guys do that while Jane hopefully can reappear yep she's yep. back oh, there she is. and if you do yeah. have any questions pop them in the chat and we will catch up with those I'll just give another 10 or 15 seconds for people to put their answers in on the poll uh, Sarah can you still uh, you got me back yep you're yeah, we you're can there. hear you <laughs> Alrighty, so I'm just sharing the poll results now. Are you able to see those, Jane? Yes, I can see those. So looking good. So it was really a, a toss up between the seasonal conditions and the market prices. So we had really um, pretty even split. There was um, maybe a couple of responses as other. So that probably makes sense considering farming uh, in a lot of the enterprises is quite reliant on those seasonal conditions. And then once we get that locked away, probably market prices becomes the next most um, variable aspect we look at in terms of our income. Oh, and Carly's into it. She's got a question here. Um, yeah, I can see that. Carly was asking, what is head in slash head out? Yeah, so that refers, Carly, to when we basically move animals from one age bracket into the next. So often when we're actually dealing with livestock throughout a cash flow period, they'll age. So they might come, when we start the cash flow period, they might be... Um, lambs at foot and then they might move to wieners so we move them from one category to the next so that we make sure when we're selling them out we sell them out as the correct category of animal so that's where you would have seen some of those movements head in head out okay All right, so I think we're back at the right spot on our presentation here. And um, yes, and sorry, I just saw Carly shoot through a quick question and it changes their value. Yes, that's um, to make sure that obviously we sell them out as the right category of animal at the right price because things obviously change depending on what they are or where they are in their growth cycle. Okay, so we're going to move on to talk about the farm variable costs. And if you had joined us last time when we were talking about the business case, I did run through this. Uh, so this is just a reminder or a prompt um, to, to remind everyone that when we're looking at our cost of production, we have these things called variable costs, which are a little bit separate to what we think of as our fixed costs of production. So the variable costs, uh, they tend to be things that fluctuate depending on how much or how little of them we utilise in our production, as opposed to the fixed costs, which generally are quite set. So they're things like our overheads, which could include rates on property, um, other things like wages and salaries for any permanent staff that we might have. Um, finance costs, if we have finance arrangements. So that's the difference there. If you're in a cropping scenario, your variable cost of production would include things like chemical and fertilizer. So essentially you can make adjustments as you go through the year as to what you use, how much. Um, and so that's why it's considered more variable. So if we move on to the next slide there, Pippa. 
So if we stick with the dairy example just for a moment, um, and this has come through from the, uh, again, Dairy Australia cash flow. So things, these are the sorts of variable costs that would be involved in dairying. So you've got your AI and herd testing, there's animal health, calf rearing, um, say in sheds, dairy supplies, uh, concentrates and fodder. So they are variable because they can fluctuate up and down. So obviously if you've had a great year's production of producing your own fodder, you'll probably purchase less of that. Um, if it hasn't been such a fabulous year, then the fodder purchases would likely increase. Obviously, uh, the other part that's variable, so in the previous example we looked at, we had, um, I think it was 273 cows. If we reduce that number down to 160, that's obviously going to have an impact directly on any of our fodder purchases or concentrates because we essentially have less animals and it'll also have that same flow on effect to our AI herd testing, animal health expenses. Uh, so around uh, say our variable costs, if we, there's a few more on the next slide as well. Um, so that's in relation to things like creating our own silage, fertilizer, nitrogen, lime, gypsum, those types of things and fuel and oil. So, and sorry to do this to you, Pippa, if I can go back to the previous slide, <laughs> I've got some assumptions that would relate to variable costs here. So things like your application rates for fertilizer and your price per tonne, they're obviously going to have a direct flow on effect to um, the budget or cash flow amounts that you put in for payments of, for fertilizer. Then further to that, there might be um, how much fodder you think you'll use over a 12 month period and what you expect to have to pay for that as a price per tonne. So you might have a few different categories there, like might be some veg hay or other types of hay. Um, and you'd obviously estimate what you think you're going to use, uh, what it's going to cost, and then you can apply, put that cost into your cash flow budget. So other things that um, would really impact cash flow would be things like the timing of fodder purchases. So obviously with fodder in a dairy situation, you're not sort of buying it in maybe every week. Um, you might get it in a truckload. And so the payments for that might be in fairly significant lumps through the year. So it's not evenly distributed. Um, and also further to that, yeah, the amount of homegrown fodder that you can produce will have an impact on all of those um, other estimates. So you'll see there is quite a bit of analysis that goes into producing a, the cash flow budget. Uh, but one of the key things and key reasons that cash flow budgets can be very useful is that as you go through the year, if any of those assumptions change significantly, so for instance, through 2019, we saw the price of fodder increase substantially, well then you can actually amend that in your cash flow budget and you'll see what sort of effect that will have on your cash flows throughout the um, period that you've budgeted for. And the benefit to that is that you, in terms of operating the business, if there is going to be an issue with maybe having to buy in a large amount of fodder and there's not sufficient uh, funds available, whether you have an overdraft limit or, or run through from cash, uh, then you can be on the front foot with uh, going to the bank, seeking some increase in facilities, or you might even have some other um, like you might move the sale of livestock forward or you might decide that you can actually push the purchase of the fodder back. So it enables you to really manage and monitor uh, the availability of cash in your business on a rolling basis. So if we go to the next slide there, Pippa, and just the next one again. So that's basically your um, variable cost summarised. So they, they can be a little bit more of a challenge trying to analyse those over a 12 month period, but there are often some industry metrics that you can use. So
say for instance, if you're involved in cropping, um, you, you'd estimate your total income that you can expect to produce through your cropping activities. And then we have some industry benchmarks that say in a dry land cropping scenario, your chemical expense should be roughly around um, 10 to 12% of your total income. And your fertilizer expense should similarly be about 10 to 12% of your estimated income. And so in that way, you can just ensure that you're not overspending in some areas and you can just ensure that you actually have budgeted enough expenditure in those areas. So we will move on to the farm fixed costs now. So they are those things that I referred to earlier. So might be wages for permanent staff, but it could include insurances, council rates, vehicle registrations, your finance costs or your drawings for living expenses. Um, the reason that they're really referred to more so as fixed costs is because they really remain in place and they don't vary much regardless of production levels. So you can understand that if you have a dairy example and you move from say 270 odd milking cows back to 160 milking cows, things like your insurances may not actually vary too much. You might still need one labour unit. Your council rates are probably not going to change at all. Uh, your finance costs won't alter unless you actually make a specific decision to sell machinery, say, that might be under finance. And further to that, any drawings that you need for your own living expenses, they're probably unlikely to change significantly regardless of whether you are milking 160 or 270 dairy cows. So one of the, I suppose, benefits of that in some ways is that they are a little bit easier to forecast and estimate because they tend to stay fairly stable from year to year. So the, the best way sometimes to look at those is if you're in an already established business, you can look back over the previous 12 months if you have some financial accounts. So you might see that in your profit and loss or if you run an online accounting software program like QuickBooks, um, you should be able to have a look in your QuickBooks and it'll, sort of, it'll tell you uh, roughly what your expenditure was for the previous 12 months. And then you can roll that forward into your cash flow um, forecast. So if we move on to the next slide, wages and drawings. And I'll just explain a little bit about wages and drawings. Um, so obviously there's, there's two separate things to consider here. So the wages and salaries can be those paid to staff or it can be the personal living expenses of the business owner. So each are equally probably important. Um, some of the things to consider in this regard is do you need additional labour? Have a think about your production cycles. When is it required? Do you need, if you're going to employ staff, do you need full-time staff, part-time or casual staff? What rates will you have to pay to employ staff members? So uh, a starting point for many would be looking at um, the relevant awards. So for a lot of businesses involved in farming, it's the pastoral award for employees. And you're looking at, uh, whilst you might have an hourly rate there in the pastoral award, sometimes you do have to pay above award payments if you want to attract and retain staff. So um, that's also something to consider. Casual staff, obviously, there's a slightly lesser commitment to those staff, but their and their hours may be varied over the year. So if you know that you have some really peak times where you're very um, busy, you would need to allow slightly more expense in your cash flow budget to account for that. Um, there's other things, even if you have permanent full-time staff over peak periods, uh, you may have to pay some overtime and so then you would need to reflect that into your cash flow budget. 
And living expenses can be a very interesting one because if you are a business owner, operator involved in running or operating your business, you are going to have some personal expenses that you need to meet from the business operations. So one way of actually factoring this is, is that you might set an actual budget amount per month into your cash flow. And so you know that that's then there to enable you to meet those types of personal expenses um, that are not necessarily classified as business expenses. So whether you do that over a month or a quarter, and then you can monitor um, if you've drawn out more than you had actually anticipated. When I was working in banking, I guess one of the interesting things there was that sometimes that was an area that we did see people drawing out more than the business was comfortably able to support. So it is important that it obviously is sufficient to meet the expenses, but then we also need to look at what expenses we have um, personally. So, if we have additional vehicles that are not part of the business, um, if they're on finance, we'd obviously need to be able to meet those types of expenses as well. So that's a bit of a summary on the key expenses and costs that we would look to be factoring into our cash flow budgets. So whilst I've given a couple of examples across say um, dairy, we really need to consider the individual industries that we're involved in. And that's probably more so for the variable costs than it is say for some of those fixed costs, which tend to be relevant to most businesses. And then wages and salaries will definitely be very dependent on what sort of business you're running and how much labor you need um, to employ to get the job done over the 12 months. So I think from there, Pippa, we might have another poll for everybody. So this one is a farm business costs poll and it's question time. So what we would like you to let us know about in terms of your farm business costs is which are the greatest uh, costs in your business, do you believe? So um, are the variable costs a greater component of your total expenses or the fixed costs? For some businesses, it may be wages and drawings uh, or for other, if there are other expenses, feel free to select that um, and we'll wait for some of your responses. All right, I'll just give another 10 or 15 seconds there. Put your answers in. Okay, and so we've got some responses there and looks like variable cost is far and away the greatest component of most people's farm business expenses, which probably isn't completely unexpected, um, considering the industries that we work in, uh, things like feed and fodder for livestock can be amongst yeah, some of those really significant costs in many farming businesses. So that looks about how we'd expect. Interestingly, no one picked wages and drawings. So, okay, I'll just come back to my main screen so I can see Sarah and Pippa. They give me a wave in case there's anything wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, all right, moving on to the next slide. All right, and we're going to look at what a summarised cash flow would look like and look I do apologize this um, slide some of the text is a little bit small because um, it gets quite involved when you get down to the um, finish of a cash flow 
I see, we'll see how we go with timing, Sarah and Pippa, if we get enough time and I can um, share the actual Excel document, we'll do that at the end. And then I can just show people the full, full thing. But basically this summarizes the um, cash flow outcomes from say a dairy example where we've gone through. So we've estimated our total milk income over a 12 month period. We've put in any of our um, overhead costs and we've estimated out our variable costs. So basically that first line is the summary of the overhead costs. The second line is more the variable expenses. And then the third line on that slide tells us about the farm operating cash surplus. And as we go across each of these columns is a month in the year. So we start at July and we finish up at June. So you'll see there as we move from left to right on that third line of the actual um, cash flow, it gives us a running total of our farm operating cash surplus on a month by month basis. So for example, in June, we, might, we have $74,500 surplus. But then if we look further down the line, it can vary from as much as $148,500 surplus to a $170,000 negative position. Now that obviously will depend on what's been happening through that um, month. So for instance, in the month, um, I think October, where we have a negative $170,000 cash surplus, we may have actually purchased a substantial amount of fodder in that month. And so we need to make payment for that and that will impact the net overall outcome of the actual month. Then we go on and there's a couple of additional items to add after the farm operating cash surplus. So there's things like interest on loans. Um, we might have some higher purchase liabilities and you'll see there that um, we've entered $12,000 a month, but we've basically got a two month gap in the middle of our cash flow cycle. Uh, because sometimes with a business like, say, for example, a dairy business, if we did dry off over, say, January, February, what we can do is um, structure some of our loan repayments to actually not occur in those months. So we just try and match up our finance payments with our actual income cycle. So then... In that um, example, we've got all of our finance costs. Now you might notice there under leases, we've got a, a cost in the fourth column of minus $150,000. And so you might think, well, I don't really um, understand what's happening there. How can we have a negative expense? So if you look further down, just in that fourth column, we have capital purchases of $150,000. So what we're doing there is we're maybe buying a new tractor. So the tractor might cost us $150,000, but we actually borrowed that money. So we put it into the cash flow as the expense in the month that it happened, but we also put in the funds that we received from the loan. And so there you have the negative 150,000 and the 150,000 in the capital purchase, and they um, obviously balance each other out so that the net effect to our actual cash flow is zero. So that's important, obviously, because if you had to pay $150,000 from your cash flow, that has quite a substantial impact in that period of time. And the reality is, if that's a tractor, that's an asset that you're going to use in your business over a length of time. So I'll talk a bit more about matching up your um, how you buy assets or your capital expenditure um, after we've sort of gone through this cash flow summary. So moving on from there, we come down to our next orange band in our cash flow. It's called the net farm cash flow. And so that's summarising the position on a month by month basis across the year after all of our additional finance costs or capital transactions. 
And you'll see that if I go over to the far right, our net farm cash flow for the full 12 months, uh, the final column there is the summary of the 12 months, was uh, $79,280. So what that in effect is saying, over that course of the 12 months with all the cash flow in from our income and the cash flow out from all of our expenses, our income exceeded our expenditure by in round numbers, uh, $80,000. So it's that $79,280. And then after that particular line as of the net cash flow, this is where we see our non-farm expenses or drawings. So we did speak about this just a bit earlier when I was talking about wages and salaries and said with business owners, it's also important that they have an allocation in there to meet their own personal expenses. So we might uh, nominate an amount of $4,000 a month. And so we pop that into our cash flow. And we see that obviously over the course of the 12 months, that would be uh, $48,000 in total. We also then put in um, a, um, tax or PAYG, so that's allowing for we have put aside $40,000 and we get to our net non-farm income and tax. The total amount there is actually $80,000. $8,000. And so you'll notice from that, that once we account for those items, our net monthly cash flow total for the full year comes down to minus $8,720. So that gives you a bit of an idea on how to formulate a cash flow over the course of a 12 month period. I would say that whilst our net monthly cash flow total is minus 8,720 or a deficit of that amount, that's the cash flow situation. And if you remember earlier in the presentation, I actually said cash flow is not profit and profit is not cash flow. So that just means that over the course of the year, we generated. Um, $8,720 less income than we spent. So it's important to know that that's the position, um, but obviously it needs to be, I guess, considered in addition to our profit and loss reporting that we'll do um, as we go through the year as well. Because some things like principal repayments on your bank loans, well, they don't actually appear anywhere in your profit and loss report. So if you're familiar with your accountant statements, you'll, you generally they'll give you a, maybe a balance sheet and a profit and loss. And so the profit and loss is a summary of income and expenses. Generally speaking, it's over a 12 month period as well. Um, but there are some things that you will physically pay for out of your business or pay cash towards uh, that don't appear in that actual uh, statement of profit and loss. And principal repayments on loans is one of those. So at the moment, we have very low interest rates. So you'll see interest expenses in your profit and loss. But if you're paying a substantial amount off your loans every month, so you might be reducing the actual loan amount, say by $2,000 a month, that means that you've paid off over 12 months, $24,000 in principal. That $24,000 you won't see in your profit and loss statement that your accountant might provide to estimate your taxable income. But however, it is cash that the business had to pay that it doesn't have available to use. So that's the reason I made that point earlier that profit's not cash flow and cash flow is not profit because the two can be quite significantly different. Now, when I get um, to the final line in my cash flow, 
one of the things that I might be really interested in understanding is did I actually have enough cash to operate my business through the year? So what we can do when we are preparing the cash flow, and we do do this with our clients to make sure that we've got enough funds in place for them, say to plant a crop and get through to harvest. We look at what they've got available at the start of the budget or cash flow period. So in this example, we've used say $50,000 is the opening balance. And then as we move along through the months, we take our opening balance and we add our net monthly cash flow total. So in that first period, you'll see we go $50,000 opening balance, then there's a 54,440 net monthly cash flow. So our closing balance at the end of that first month being June would be $104,440. And as we work our way across throughout the year, what we can do is check to make sure that it all points throughout the year. We have sufficient cash available to be able to pay our expenses. So if that um, cumulative cash flow total at the bottom ever ran into the negative, that would tell us that there might be a cash flow problem in that month. And we might need to have a look at the timing of some of our expenses, maybe adjust some things, or we could also um, look at getting an overdraft facility in place. Now, when I know that we have been talking a lot about this um, series of webinars about being ready or able to apply for finance, I can guarantee you this type of document is something that most finance providers will actually be very interested to see. And if you can produce a document like this that tells the story of your business throughout 12 months, that goes a long way to giving a finance provider or your bank manager a great level of confidence that you have an understanding of how to manage your business cash flows throughout the year. So that means that you have thought about when your cash flow income is likely to arrive and what expenses you need to meet throughout the year. So I can pretty much guarantee you there's nothing worse than a customer comes to you and uh, says that they've basically run out of cash flow to be able to pay expenses um, and they hadn't estimated it and they need the money in two weeks time. It's very challenging and banks are not that at getting things done at the moment. They're um, based finance applications um, sorted out. Okay, so that's the cash flow summary that I wanted to just talk you through. I think if we go to the next slide, Pippa. I just give a couple of examples here on how different cash flows might look. And if you joined us last time, you might have seen this particular example. So I was looking here um, at the cash flow that might, what it might look like if you were running, for example, a feedlot operation. So what you'll see in this example is we have an overdraft limit at about at $20,000 and the green line is our bank balance throughout the 12 months. The orange bars are our income and the gray bars are our expenses. So for instance, in January there, we only have expenses, we had no income. So it's those types of things that it's important to have an understanding of how that looks for your business throughout 12 months. So moving on to the next, slide if I could. Okay, thanks Pippa. This is an example in a cropping type business and this is a pattern we see um, a lot in cropping uh, broad acre or mixed farming enterprises. So pretty much mostly it's expenses through March to October and so we see that the balance of the bank account runs down right towards the overdraft limit. And then come October, we've generally got some of the crop off, we start to sell commodity and we can replenish that bank balance. And then coming back into that sort of later March, we should have um, funds back in the account, ready to go again for another 12 months. 
Uh, and I'll move on to the next slide. Thanks, Pippa. We're going to have a cash flow poll. So it's question time again, everyone. Hope you're all still out there ready to participate for our next question. So what we want to know here is, um, this is just a bit of an understanding of what does a cash flow budget tell you about your business? So very much you can answer this from your own personal uh, view and if you use cash flows, what, how they can help you in your own business. So if you could just submit a poll response there and let us know what your thoughts are, that'd be great. And I've uh, managed to make it, I don't want to moz myself, but I've managed to make it through 30 minutes or so with a stable internet connection, so. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Alrighty, so I think we've got all our answers in, so I'll share the results now. Excellent. Oh, wow. Okay, so there's a range of responses. I think we were able to actually select more than one. So, um, and that makes sense because cash flows actually can help with a number of different items. So uh, quite a few answers all suggested that it assists with planning. And that's a really great um, bit of feedback to get because that's 100% I would agree that the greatest uh, contribution that a cash flow budget can make uh, is to assist with that planning element. Sometimes um, people might respond when I suggest that a budget or a cash flow budget is a good idea. Uh, they sort of indicate, oh, it's too hard, things change. Uh, it can't be, you know, we can't get it right. And I always work with our clients. It's not about having it as a perfect crystal ball. It's more about how we think the business will look from a perspective of income and expenses today. And then as we go through the year, we can actually amend and change that depending on what's happening. And that's, to me, that's 100% the best value that a cash flow gives you as a planning tool and also being able to monitor. Um, it will 100% also assist to budget finance repayment. So it gives you a very good um, diagnostic tool to use to really analyze whether the finance payments are gonna put the business under cash flow stress. It does also tell us about peak cash flow, break even production volumes and break even commodity prices, because we can use the cash flow to test all of those sorts of scenarios. So excellent, great responses. Really happy to see everyone participating there. Okay. So how are we going for time? Sarah, Pippa, I'm on track, I think. So yeah. we're good. <laughs> I think you've done you've done well. We haven't had any more questions come through in the chat. So I think we're ready to, to move on to capital expenditure, Jane. Excellent. Okay, well, capital expenditure, one of the reasons that I've added this in uh, is because generally speaking, it does require cash. <laughs> so it might be though that there are different ways in which that cash can be acquired. So I wanted to talk us through this a little bit because I, in my experience in banking, one of the key things that businesses often ran themselves into trouble with is that they made purchases of capital items and they did it out of their cash flow. And basically, if they weren't using cash flow budgeting or they didn't really have a good understanding of their income and expenses, sometimes they would use today's cash to pay for a capital expenditure, but that cash actually was gonna be needed in four, five, six months time to pay some expenses. So I definitely wanted to cover this off with you all when we were talking about cash flow tonight. So some of the capital items that you would buy in um, operating a business might include um, land. There might be some sheds or infrastructure. So that might be feed and fodder storage. So silos might be a component of that. 
Um, machinery uh, might also be purchased. Uh, so you might use equipment finance or leases there, but that would be things like potentially tractors, um, headers, even your quad bikes or side-by-sides if that's what you're using. Um, so all those sorts of items that you use on or in the farming operation. Uh, clearly vehicles, utes and cars fit into this um, category of capital expenditure. Also things like yards, so your livestock handling facilities uh, or even trucks and trailers if you're utilising those to move um, potentially livestock, grain, fodder, fertiliser, etc. So all of those types of purchases, which are not really considered to be just in the normal course of business operations. I mean, you definitely use these items in the normal course of business operations, but if you have a look and a think about these ones, um, it's something that you might buy today that you'll use in the business over a long period of time. So it won't be just a, you don't purchase a shed, use it for a year and then discard it. You generally, if you build a shed, you'll use it over many, many years. So the idea there is if you're going to build it today and use it over many, many years, um, it's going to generally often cost a significant amount of money. And so it can, always, it can be a hard thing to try and pay for that out of one year's business operations. Okay, so if I move to the next slide in our little pack, I'm giving you here a tip on budgeting items. So if you're not familiar with the term CAPEX, it really just stands for capital expenditure. So if you go and talk to, um, a, you know, you might be talking to a consultant or you might be talking to a bank manager and they might mention the word CAPEX, all they're really talking about is this capital expenditure. So they're wanting to know about what you plan to spend on maybe plant equipment over a given period of time. So our recommendation when considering um, items that you want to buy for the business, and often they'll be to assist you in operating the business, is that you set an actual budget over a specific time frame. So some people will do this over three years and some might run it over five. The idea is that you schedule any capital items that you're planning to purchase. So you don't try and put them all into one year because uh, that can certainly lead to an amount of cash flow stress in a business if it can't comfortably meet those commitments. So when you're thinking about a CapEx budget over the time frame, think about um, what you'll acquire, what might need to be replaced and what you can sell. Um, over, I do make the point there, overspending on capital items can be one of the sources of cash flow stress if the available cash was needed for future expenses. You can also use finance to pay the equipment off over a longer time frame, but then you need to consider um, budgeting those repayments. Also, I'd really encourage everyone to prioritise their spending on items that either increase income reduce costs or eliminate oh and risks. So there's always only a certain bucket of money, but there's usually a lot more opportunities that we would love to pursue or a lot more items we'd like to buy or spend our money on. But it's just always a matter that we need to prioritise where we're going to spend each dollar. And another um, point I'd like to really make is that sometimes we think, oh, but I'm going to save this will, if I buy this, it will save me a lot of time. But sometimes saving time doesn't always equate to actually saving money. So uh, if you obviously have staff that you employ and they're doing that task, um, unless you can really somehow reduce the hours that they're working or reduce their actual um, costs of employment, then you're not really going to save money um, by spending money on an item that they might use to be more efficient, unless you can absolutely use them in some other capacity that's going to be able to help you generate additional income or save money somewhere else. 
So if we move on to the next slide, and I think we're getting close to the end now, and just again, so what I'm uh, done here is to just give you a little bit of a heads up. If you are looking at something like purchasing a truck, um, say if the item cost is $70,000, that might be a really um, stress, large significant expenditure if you had to try and pay for it out of cash flow. Uh, so you might consider taking a loan over say five years and pay it off over that period of time. Something smaller like a side by side, if it's say 25,000, you might pay for that in cash. And that might be okay if there is capacity within that cash flow. But something like a new tractor, well, if that's a significant expense around $150,000, you might use some equipment finance and you can do things like put balloon payments at the end of the finance because that will reduce down the actual payments that you have to make throughout the year. And generally speaking, that tractor in five years will still be worth an amount of money. So you're trying there to just, we always used to say, try and match how you pay for things um, with their useful life in your business. Other things like land, obviously quite significantly more expense involved there. So for example, in that situation, you might take a loan and it might be over a much longer period of time, it might be 15 years, 20 years, because the reality is obviously that that land will be available to use in your business over a very long period of time. Other things like hay sheds, you might be able to um, borrow the money over a five year term, you might even do it a bit longer because a hay shed will generally be available to be used you know, for a good 10 to 20 years if it's well built. So there, there might be some other items. Sorry, just uh, bear with me for a second. Um, things like laser levelling. Um, so still, even though it's conducted on the paddock, that is actually an expense that you might um, pay from cash flow if you, when you're doing the cash flow budget, um, that can be afforded. Okay, so Pippa, I think we'll go to the next slide, which I think might be our final item poll and question time. So we'll launch into that. Okay, so if you could let us know, are you planning to purchase any of the following capital items? We've got trucks, tractors, vehicles, sheds, maybe do some laser leveling. So if you wanted to vote and submit your answers to us, thanks. And while Jane's just disappeared for a moment, we hope she's okay <laughs> down there. Sorry, oh, we do have any questions. information here under my desk, <laughs> so. Uh. <laughs> Look, any questions, pop them in the chat. We will um, have a chance to get to them. Okay, so we've got quite a few responses there and it looks like um, a large number of people are looking at putting sheds in their business. So certainly um, helps in terms of feed and fodder storage and those those actual expenses can really assist with uh, cash flow sometimes. Obviously, if you can store more uh, feed and fodder, then you're less susceptible to having to buy it in the market when prices are higher. So also trucks, tractors, vehicles, there was a bit of a smattering across all of those categories. So thanks everyone for and participating. We've just had one more capital item listed in the chat, which is to purchase land. So thanks for that contribution. Yeah. Yeah, so land is definitely um, a capital item for sure. <laughs> so, um, there is another question. Do we have a preferred software or do we use only Excel? It's a really uh, interesting question. Thanks, Stephanie. Look, Excel is definitely um, sufficient if that's what you've got access to. There are some softwares out there. We use a fairly specialised one um, when we're doing our cropping and livestock budgeting called AgProfit. So it's really what you're comfortable to use 
I would at least say if you need to set up a cash flow, Excel would would assist. Zero and Maya, they tend to be quite good for recording um, your income and expenses as you go through the year, but I haven't really had great success using them for forecasting or future budgets on a monthly basis. Um, and one of the benefits of things like Excel, it's quite easily amended. So as I talked about, if you have to monitor changes in prices, et cetera, you can pretty easily um, do that on an Excel program. Okay, no problems. Feel free, Stephanie, if you had a specific question on a like industry, I'm more than happy to, you know, try and help you out with anything that might be available. There's a lot of web-based um, tools. So certainly through, for example, Dairy Australia, I did find obviously they, they provide a template that you can download. Um, and I think if we move through, I know we're wrapping up now, Sarah, but we do give you some, um, some further resources uh, before we finish. Yeah. So there you go. So if you look at your different um, industry research and development organisation, some of those will actually have quite good tools that you can use to do cash flow budgets and forecasts. So I might hand over Sarah for your evaluation polls. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. All right, I've just yeah, launched those, those now, Sarah. So <laughs> that, Thank you. that is happening. Good job, Pippa. Thank you. Um, the other thing in our Young Farmer Business Network Facebook group, a while ago, um, there was some comments around different uh, software programs that people use. So um, it might be a while ago now. So feel free to pop that question back in the in the comments in our Facebook group and see if there's any new ones that people are using. But um, yeah, so thanks. That was a good question. And while we're going with the um, polls, we can remember that we've still got three more of these sessions to go. So uh, farm business risks uh, on the 29th of April. Um, so, and then the business risks impact on cash flow, and then putting the plan into action on the 27th of May. And what we'll do is we will pop in the chat the link um, to register for the next session on the 29th of April. So you can do that. And I just saw there, Sarah, sorry to interrupt, Liam um, just mentioned in the chat that business grants have rebates on Myob, QuickBook and Zero. So thanks very much, Liam. Yeah. Certainly any one of those online packages is really great for being able to um, keep your financial records compiled in a timely way, which I know helps, um, especially with your accountant. <laughs> Yeah. How are we looking, Pippa? There are a fair few of those evaluation questions. Yeah, I will just give people another 20 or 30 seconds. Um, it looks like we've got most of the answers have come in now, though. So thank you, everyone, for providing feedback. That's really helpful to us when we put these things on for you. Fantastic. All righty, so I'm going to close that off now. Cool. All right. Thanks, people. Right. Well, we do have a couple more minutes. I don't know, Jane, if you want to switch to the, have a crack at switching to your Excel thing, I will make you the host and yeah, yeah, I'm happy see, to have a have a quick go. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can screen share. Oh, wow. Here we go. Okay. So just um, quickly while we've got a few moments, 
I wanted to show. So it, I did show it all, but this is the full document. So if you went to the Dairy Australia website, anyone can download this. So what I did working through as I showed you in the early slides, or go right to the top, completed the cash income forecasts. Uh, so we got to a total amount and then basically this whole template is just uh, available to you. So scroll through and you um, would obviously look at all your income and expenses across these categories. And so then it does automatically tallies them up for you. Then you work through your overheads. Um, your finance costs, and that's how we then came to this cumulative cash flow. And for example, I believe if I can change this, um, say for example, we started with a hundred thousand dollar opening balance. If I hit enter or move my cursor, you'll see that that automatically adjusted all of our carry forward. Similarly, if I go, oh, actually, it wasn't a hundred thousand; it was zero dollars. Then we automatically adjust down and you'll see then that in April, May, uh, June, we potentially have a slight cash flow problem because we do end up in the negative. So that means that uh, unless we have an overdraft limit in place, we don't quite have enough income in that month of April um, to meet all the expenses we were planning to, uh, to spend our money on. So that might mean that we hold back on some particular expenses and we move them to other months or we adjust some other aspect of our cash flow. So I might leave it there mm -hmm. with that one and not go too much further in, but a lot of the industry bodies do have cash flow templates. So that's probably a really good first port of call if you are looking for something to get started with. Um, and certainly if you wanted to send me an email um, if you have a specific industry you're looking for, and I can maybe give you a few suggestions. So other than that, that's a wrap from me, but I do, um, I do really want to reiterate that, yeah, cash flows, especially if you are looking to grow and expand your business or make a land purchase, um, if you have to go and seek farm finance, uh, probably a cash flow is one of the first things that you might be asked to produce by a finance provider. So absolutely great business tool. And I'd encourage everyone to, um, you know, have a go at producing one if they haven't done so already. And the more you do them, the better you get at them. That's what I found. So give it a go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, and thanks everyone for persevering with our little technical glitches this evening. Uh, we will edit those out of the recording. So if you want to have another crack at it, <laughs> we'll give that a try. Or I'll do another run uh, through one of the others, Sarah. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. And we've just popped the link in to register for the next session. So thanks again, everyone. And Jane, we really appreciate your time this no. evening hope to see you next time thank you and sorry all it was my internet connection so <laughs> okay I'll make sure thank it's you next time <laughs>